Yeah, so just kind of. Wait, let me oh, get comfortable okay, first. Jesus. <laughs> no bloopers. Um, there might be. Hey y'all, welcome back to another episode of A Baby Marble Stand Reviews. Today, I am still a baby marble stand, but I have a, a veteran marble stand with me. This is my friend Grant, and he's going to introduce himself. Yeah, what's up guys? Uh, my name is Grant. I, uh, I've been a marble fan since 2008, so the very beginning with Iron Man. Um, pretty much have been a Marvel fan even before then with the Spider-Man movies uh, coming out in the early 2000s. So got a pretty good base knowledge um, going into this, you know, familiar with the characters, comics, most of the universe in general. Um, so a lot of today uh, we'll be highlighting obviously those things, uh, major parts of a certain movie, um, and then also a political, um, governmental focus on it too since I actually study public policy and kind of have that background to uh, do kind of just a base and simple uh, analysis of what goes on with the movies and, you know, the realism behind uh, uh, different issues. So. Right. Today we're going to be talking about Captain America's Civil War, which is why I brought Grant into this because of his background in policy. All right, I guess we should start off with the obvious question would be Team Cap or Team Rock. So it's wait, isn't Iron Man your favorite Avenger? Yeah, so Iron Man is my favorite Avenger, but I would definitely say this topic isn't just a black and white issue. You know, it's not necessarily one side or the other. And I feel like a lot of times during this uh, this debate, you know, you hear that it's strictly Iron Man team or Cap team. I think that you know, through the conflict in the short term, we see that. There's definitely a tendency on one side uh, for there to be more validity, but over the course of the um, Marvel Universe, we do see that both sides are gaining more validity in terms of government corruption, um, you know, terrestrial conflict on Earth, and then in the universe as a whole. So there, there's really not just like a one side issue in this. Yeah. I agree with Grant. Um, you guys know that my favorite Avenger is Cap, or Steve when he was Cap. And on my first watch, I definitely was like, oh my god, Team Cap, but since I've rewatched Civil War a bunch of times now, um, I also don't think it's a black and white issue. Yeah, the uh, next big highlight of the whole premise of Civil War in this debate is really going to be um, international sovereignty of the nations on Earth. Um, so, you know, ranging from all the nations that are in the UN participating in the Accords to just that galactic presence. So. You know, really, that galactic presence comes from different Avengers affiliations. So Thor, for example, it, the question comes into play is how can you monitor a being that's not even from your realm of the universe or the galaxy with your laws, customs, and regulations of your government, you know, of your particular country? And even with all of the governments of many countries unified together. So that's a big issue that I think that's pretty prevalent in terms of how one side is distinguished from another. Mm -hmm. uh, so like, what do you think that like the balance of the whole conflict would be like if Thor was um, at the Soviet Sokovia Accord, it's conference? I honestly feel like if Thor were there, the movie would not have been as long because I think he would have started with Steve just because of the fact that he's not from that realm of the universe. He, how can I sign this piece of paper and it control me? And I also feel like even if we made it to the point that Thor was at the place like where they had the, what is it, the embassy to like yeah. to ratify them, I don't think Zemo could have been successful in like staging that attack because Thor would have been there, maybe. Now let me go into this. So we know that in, you know, Civil War that Wanda's not even present at the point right. because they've deemed her, you know, a threat that's far too grave. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, since those governments recognize her as that prominent of a threat, and you know, at this point in the universe, she doesn't have the power she has in WandaVision right. or Infinity War, not nearly on that same level. Or the controls. Or the controls. 
don't you think that his power might be overwhelming for the events going on there, given that like he, he one is not as powerful as him and that they would be intimidated or that if he did try to, you know, burst out with his thunder, lightning, all, you know, all the flair that it could cause more destruction and just prove the case for the Sokovia yes. Accords. I do see that being a factor, but I also think that, I don't know how exactly it would play out, but it wouldn't have gone the same way in the way that like Tony kept Wanda at the, at the compound. Thor would not have stayed there. He definitely would not have listened to Tony and be like, oh, I'm just gonna chill here. Like, no. Um, so I do think that they would have been threatened by like his power and like what he could do with it. The question that I can't answer is like, where would he have been while that's going on? Okay, fair enough. The next topic we'll be highlighting is pretty much the, um, you know, the concern with the personal vendettas and relationships of people both on the Avengers, um, tying in with the Sokovia Accords, and then also the uh, governments that come into play. What extent do you think the Sokovia Accords is and having the concern with personal relationships of the members of the Avengers, but also how do you think that same type of logic and problem that they have is problematic with themselves, given that, you know, governments and different institutions can have those personal vendettas or problems. Because like people are the ones making the policy and these like documents, there's always a chance that like something can be askew because of the fact that there's like the human element element involved i mean even with this isn't the same type of comparison but with nick fury and like shield and he was still trying to hold on to it even after we found out hydra infiltrated it so it's like you can't really because he was so attached to the organization was like, okay, let's try and salvage it but in some cases like you really can't um okay. so that's kind of how the judgment is kind of there but then i do think in terms of the Avengers, the Accords could be beneficial just because they don't have a check and balances system. They only have each other. And if there's something in the way of that, that might be like, for example, the conflict between Tony and Steve, it might have been, it might have been better to have someone like be a mediator. Yeah. In that case, the, the document, the Accords, but um, yeah, I could kind of go either way. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree um, with that concept that, like, a lot of the um, personal aspects can really just translate into how things are addressed smoothly with how the formal institutions are formed, um, which comes largely in part from just experience and, like, the, you know, ongoing and living documents of legislature and just, like, you know, for example, the Constitution. It's a living document. I like that you brought up that it, it's a living document. That's one thing that's not really like discussed in the movies, but it's probably implied. Which, I mean, Tony kind of said like, you know, these things can be amended in the future, but in the moment it's like, okay, are we gonna sign it? Or are we not gonna sign it? And it's, I think because it's such an immediate concern. And they didn't get a lot of notice. Like the Secretary of State showed up and he was like, okay, we're, gonna, we're gonna be meeting about it in like two days or whatever. So it was just kind of that, um, the like pressure to make a decision yeah. right then. So that's like one thing that could have like changed how that went. Yep. But there was more thought into it. And then when there's that political pressure, you know, some entities, you know, want to make sure that they have that control in place and that they don't feel like it's out of their hands. You know, in this case, um, the governments don't feel in control of the Avengers, so their safeguard, you know, is like they feel like it's non-existent. So we kind of touched on at the beginning how the like team cat versus team iron is in black and white. And in my case, I was put off by the parts at the beginning because of how they were introduced and the sense of like, oh, the Avengers, it's your fault that there's all this destruction after the fights in New York or DC, like Lago, yeah. all of that. Um, but the question is like, if the Avengers didn't intervene or they didn't step in to help, what would be the alternative? Like, what what other options do we have? Like, should they be leaning? We, we kind of highlighted a big part of this aspect before is the, like, 
the threat level and assessing that and just really acknowledging if the Avengers have the resources and capability to be able to handle it more than one government or another or these governments collectively. Some of those benefits, you know, of the Avengers inter uh, intervening um, will be stability, really knowing that the team is together and immediate and ready to go because this is their work, this is their li livelihood, is to protect the state of the world, not necessarily just the citizens of one country or another, as we've seen that they went to go address a conflict in a whole other country. Um, so that's beneficial that they are immediate and ready to go. But on the other hand, you know, there are those personal relationships, again, that we've talked about before that can impact that readiness. So I think that is obviously like a double-sided issue um, and that we might need to be skeptical with that is a consequence of them intervening because what if the team is broken? As we've seen in Infinity War, right. where the galactic threat isn't addressed and isn't addressed by the governments because we didn't really see any action from them aside from like the chaos that happens throughout the entire movie. So it's left up to the Avengers, the disbanded Avengers to handle that threat. I also think that, um, you know, with them not intervening and using enhanced abilities and knowledge and resources that, again, the conflict can escalate even further than it would have, as we can see in um, the first Avengers movie, right. as an example. You know, again, where Loki uh, comes in and screws up New York pretty bad, or Ultron, because if the Avengers weren't there to stop Ultron, then the uh, whole city of Sokovia would have collapsed into the earth and a cataclysmic event would have occurred and no government can stop that. We don't have the technology capable of that. I mean, the members of the Avengers did, but again, this draws into the question of the personal vendettas, whether it's guilt that people like Tony face, and the consequences that have in terms of, you know, creating this like snowball of problems that we can also see with him creating Ultron that just consequent consequentially leads to Ultron being created himself. So, right. um, you know, it's just a really a matter of depending on their stability because we know that their resources and capabilities are going to outweigh the governments unless the governments have their own superhumans and advanced individuals. Okay, so since you mentioned resources, who do you think should be blamed for the destruction? Because that was kind of like the big opening talking point for the Secretary of State being like, well, when you left New York, when you left DC, like all these destructions there. But like in the example of the first Avengers, I mean, to say the Avengers weren't there to fight Loki in that threat, and the National Guard shows up late because they didn't even know what was going on, but I digress. So they show up they're still causing stuff with like their tanks coming in and like probably damaging streets and people's cars too. So it's like, who should be to blame for the aftermath in these things? So, kind of already shown in this, I feel like a lot of issues are always painted in black and white, mm -hmm. and that it's one side or the other because, you know, it also all depends on perspective and who benefits and who doesn't. I think if the event in itself wasn't caused by them, then they are not necessarily responsible in some ways, but then they are if, you know, some of the actions that don't have regard for people in the area, whether it's Hulk smashing on buildings and killing people and things like that, or then that's, Wanda. or Wanda, that's what, when it can come into play that they do have some type of uh, blame to claim um, in those situations. You know, they're doing their best, but sometimes doing your best isn't always the best thing to do in itself because of the consequences, whether they're intentional or unintentional, to have on, on people. So it really depends on the cause and the context of the issue that's going on. But with like an event like Sokovia and Tony 
causing the creation of Ultron, you know, that's that's a circumstance where it's on him for those people right. dying because he created the problem that caused death. Yeah. So. I mean, okay, that begs the question. I keep going back to Avengers, but I feel like it's the best example for the Accords, despite it not being the actual movie. But, okay, Loki coming to Earth. Like, someone could argue, all right, well, Thor is here. He can handle that. Then he came because of the Tesseract, which Nick Fury slash S.H.I.E.L.D. kind of had. And, like, that goes back to Howard Stark. And, like, why did we even have the Tesseract to begin oh, yeah, with? Yeah. Like, so I feel like that's another gray area in terms of, like, could it be the Avengers for the bill for that? Could it be the government? Should they collaborate? Which they have trouble doing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and I think that just kind of brings in the point to you again that like we don't know, you know, the intention. Or as Steve said, actually, agendas change, mm -hmm. and so what he, what his validity in the Avengers acting as their own, you know, organization and being is that their agenda is one thing by saving and protecting people and by letting the governments control them if their agendas don't line up with saving and protecting people as we saw in the Winter Soldier where right. the government organization SHIELD was infiltrated by HYDRA and their agenda changed from their initial purpose which was to save and protect people then we don't know what can happen. Who do you think the Avengers like belong to? Iron Man? Because at the end of the movie, you know, Steve writes to Tony and he's like, the Avengers are yours more so than mine. But aside from Civil War, like most of the times when the Avengers are together, Cap is the one calling the shot, or Steve is the one calling the shot. They've always acted as a bow and arrow. Mm -hmm. um, so you need one and you need the other to be able to do what it was designed for, what its purpose was, you know. Steve, Steve provides the leadership, the morale, um, you know, the really execution and guidance and direction that the team needs in addressing the conflicts and being able to efficiently resolve them. Tony, I think, is, you know, he's the resourceful guy and that helps, like, tighten the, the notches and uh, tweaks, you know, the small things that need to be corrected in order to do it in a way that's not necessarily detrimental for the team or others around him um, in ways. But we do see his impulse get in the way of that. So I think that in ways that they they balance out each other because they're different personalities and styles of leadership um, and really just uh, contributions to the team overall. So I think that it's balanced, but in terms of the morale of the team, you know, Cap's got that. He's, he's, he's way ahead. What about you? I agree with pretty much everything, and I would like to, like, tack on that, like, the resources, like, they really wouldn't have anywhere to, like, regroup without Tony, mm -hmm. just because yeah. of his, like, financial resources, period. So, um, I feel like he's definitely, obviously, an essential part of the team, and, I mean, Steve has him be on the whole morale thing, and I'm, like, completely biased toward him on that front, but, yeah, you can't have him tell you Thank you guys for watching. Thank you, Grant, for being a guest on my channel. Yep, happy to be here. Um, he might come back, who knows? I don't know, I don't See? like to keep Tony <laughs> apologists in my presence for too long. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> but um, make sure to subscribe if you haven't yet. Like the video. And um, yeah, I will see you guys next time.